call upon the dead to rise! Does some of this come down in? Uh, no, in terms of the writing, Steve. Is, is there evidence either from the archaeology or yeah, writings yeah. of? We know by the maiden heaps what they did. Roughly. So are you ar archaeologists? Or? No, no. We just do our research. Just do our research. Experience what it's like. Oh, it's really yeah. 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 They obviously stop it. Yeah. Yeah. As the silver horn yeah. Yeah. They yeah. each yeah. member to be part of the silver yeah. horn yeah. So they have to have been in society. Yeah! 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 Yeah!
He's a big enough target, come on! And then gang, where are you? Gang! After the crowd march, do a circle. Alright? After the crowd march, if you want to, we're doing a circle, with or without. Both. Yes. Both. All of us. Bless the audience. Where? So. Are you ready to see the Warriors! Pick your targets! Yeah, yeah. And
Oh dear. But, um, well, this is our um, my. It, it's put, we're a mixture between Viking and Anglo-Saxon, and what we try and recreate is through the period between 793 and 1066. So from when the first recorded um, uh, raid, big raid, happened on Lindisfarne, right up to the Norman Conquest. So that's the period that we try and reenact. So although we cut, we're classed as a Viking group. The mix between the Vikings and the Anglo-Saxons in this country, obviously, at that point, was very, um, very pronounced. Um, so what we have in here is, is we're um, on a we're outside of our normal town. We're actually visiting the abbey, and what I've got here is just a camp that I've been cooking for for our village um, on the move. So we have some of the um, the Viking. What the type of carrots that we think would have been available at the time, which were the same as our carrots, except none of the orange carrots, carrots that came through in the 17th century, these would have been mainly purple, black, and, and kind of white. These are just a range of some of them, they're a bit tired now because we've been here since Saturday, but lots of greens, so the cabbages and the kales, nothing like spinach because that hadn't come in yet. Um, green beans, uh, sorry, um, broad beans, uh, no green beans or French beans. So field beans, board beans, which can be used as a fresh vegetable, but also you can dry the beans and then grind them for flour, um, if need be, you know, when if your cereal crop fails. Um, there was celery, but not as common as everything else. Parsnips, turnips, nothing like a swede, uh, which were a, a, a breed, you know, they were a, pros a hybrid that, that came later. Certainly nothing like potatoes, tomatoes, uh, coffee, tobacco, all those things that came across from, from America later on, they weren't in Europe at that time. But certainly the cabbages and the kales. Fruit wise, um, things like apples, pears, plums, um, they were very readily available. And a lot of that evidence they comes from the large archaeological finds and what they've been able to analyse you know, from the um, things that have dried and been put into uh, grave goods. Uh, but also the Anglo-Saxons, the, with the monasteries, they were actually recording Barry, stuff. Barry, are you still in there? No, he's gone there. Um, so they, um, they were actually uh, recording and having correspondence between the, um, the monks and the abbots and things in, in um, England and Europe. Um, but even things like the Venerable, Venerable Bede, he was writing down in the 7th century. Um, through to the conversations with um, this one a guy called um, Anthimus, who um, was writing between the Gaulish um, kingdom and monasteries in England. So there's lots of written evidence, not recipes, not recipe books, although his was his did have some recipes in it, but mostly it's taken from things like the like leech stores. So where the herbal law told about the herbs and such like uh, that they would use and therefore they were obviously growing them so presumably they would be using them in cooking as well and as I say from the archaeological finds they can find a lot in these days as to what was actually in there so we're pretty confident about the type of vegetables that would have been grown at the time we have to guess how they would have cooked from a lot of experimental stuff I mean the amount of metal that we have in a firebox like this this wouldn't be authentic um, particularly uh, there's not too much metal in there for, um, for a normal family to be able to afford. But um, where we're reenacting, obviously it would be very tough if we dug a fire pit down from the ground or whatever, so we have to do it the best way we can. But certainly the evidence for cooking stews you know, in cauldrons and things, communally, um, is, is a lot more common. So yes, they did have spit roasts, uh, which is what everybody thinks of, but you wouldn't do them very often. They'd be for feasting and you know, high seasons. And part of that is because it's very wasted. A lot of the fat and everything goes into the fire and is wasted. And it's a lot of effort. Somebody has to sit and rotate it and, and such like. So getting everything into a stew pot um, is a lot more valuable in terms of keeping the nutrition in there. And you just add to it from day on day. So it's not like you can't say that you've had a fish stew today and a mutton stew tomorrow. It would just be whatever's left in the pot today, you'd just be adding into it, so it keeps going. And also you'd use different parts of the fire. So people tend to think that, you know, think of a roaring fire. In actual fact, you most of you cooking over the embers. And you can bake in the embers as well. So, uh, the day before yesterday, we actually had a piece of lamb that was wrapped in a, sour, uh, a salt dough that we cooked in the embers. But also some of the ceramic pots, you can just bake things, so soapstone pots, you can cook very slowly, um, very gently in the embers, so you can uh, maintain the fire. Uh, uh, 
and good break. So I try and grow the vegetables as close to what we think is available at the time. And then actually, I mean, the big thing as well is, is the lack of waste. So on Saturday, um, I started with a couple of buckets full of milk and took the cream off um, to create uh, butter, that's all that's left now actually, um, to make the butter. Because nothing, as I say, nothing went to waste. So that would be the butter. You could then use the buttermilk, which is really nutritious, either for um, feeding, to, you know, so the children would drink it, anybody that's an invalid would have had it, but then used in the new cooking as well. To cook the um, once you take the, 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 the butter out of it, in the pot over there, I don't know if you can see with the white cloth over it. Oh yeah, got it. Yes, I don't know if you can. In that one is the milk that's left after I've taken the, the, the cream out. So I don't know if you can see, but it's actually thickening already, it's souring. And what I'm doing is I'm letting that naturally sour uh, and go off on its own. With then once it's gone sour and I'm happy with the sour look content, I can actually use rennet and separate it and make it soft cheese. And the easiest sort of fresh cheese that comes out from that process is like that one. Um, a bit like cottage cheese modern day, but drier. Um, and then you just compress it down and get uh, as much of the whey out as you can. Um, if you then want to turn it into hard cheese, it's more a matter of salting it and then keeping it uh, wrapped, turning it, pressing it, turning it, pressing it, keeping it uh, clean, and it eventually it matures um, into a type of cheese. And the scale is very differently in how you do that maturing process. But once you take the, the curds off to make the cheese, a really valuable product is left even after that. Again, I've got what I've got left now um, over the weekend. But that's the whey that's left after you've taken the curds out. And that's a really valuable product. Um, the bag is for drinking. It's a very safe thing to drink. It's very acidic. Um, it's got a lot of bacteria in it, but they're not harmful bacteria. Um, but because it's so acidic, one of the beautiful beauties of it is for food preservation. So in there is actually those plums. I've started to preserve them in the way. Now, if I was going to try and save that over the, week, over the winter, I'd obviously fill it with whey and then seal it with fat or uh, wax to keep it and that was stored for many months um, again not not as sweet as modern taste would be um, quite a bit more sour but um, they probably almost certainly they didn't have a sweet tooth like we have because the only sources of sweetness were the, obviously the one that everybody thinks about with honey but again honey wasn't farmed you couldn't go to the shop and buy it you would have to trade it with a monastery if you could because they were probably the only people that kept bees in any numbers or you'd catch a local swarm, or but it basically wouldn't be as familiar and as common as it is now. Obviously, fruit sugars was another way you could get anything sweet, and then things like malt. So when you've been making the beer, um, the malt has a kind of we probably wouldn't class it as sweet now, but when you have not had a sweet, you know, a, a sweet palate, um, the malt has kind of a sweet, and you can use it to flavour foods. So if they're your only sources of sweetness, your palate is very different. So they would have drunk the whey we have there. It's quite acidic. And been, that would have been fine. Um, some of the herbs that they used would actually give a slightly more bitter flavour than maybe we're used to now. I mean, the one that everybody's familiar with is kind of hops. And a lot of people think that kind of some of the lagers are more bitter. And you call them bitter, don't you, some of them? Um, and again, because of the, that, that was more of a taste that was prevalent at the time. Um, you then, I mean, you had to try and get as much in preservation, particularly like over the next few months, um, as the harvests are coming in. But one of the things that you can have to take you through the winter is stuff that's been seriously dried. So if you look at this product here, this is actually dried cod. And it's, you have to have a very cold, but in particular a very dry climate. So it doesn't have to be hot, but it needs to be very, very dry. But it can be dry from being frozen, as long as there's no you know, uh, liquid water around. And basically what they did was they prepared the, 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 prepare the card, hang it out in January, and by June it might be ready, it might be dry. Um, 
um, and then it was a valuable export because it lasts, as I say, it lasts for years. Um, preparing it is interesting. You literally take a piece and beat it to, a, to within a minute, well, an inch of your life. You beat it for an hour with it like a stick and then soak it for 12 to 24 hours. And then you can start to use it as a cooking, but it's intensely fishy. But unlike salt cod, it obviously doesn't add a lot of salt to the meal unless you add the salt. That's it. And salt was something that they, they had. They had sea salt, they had rock salt, but they would always try and recover it. So if they salted a piece of meat, whatever they did, then they would try and save it. If they make brined something, they would try and recover the salt um, from that because it was a precious product. Um, I'll tell you something about some of the herbs that we did. North of the island is separated from the mainland by a short stretch of water. But when the tide goes out, there is a narrow, narrow causeway. Bit of causeway. Oh, look, there's a narrow causeway. If the tide hasn't gone out yet. Oh, I'm sorry. I said, when the tide goes out, there is a narrow causeway which leads to the island. Anyway, at first, the two armies couldn't do much except for say rude things to one another. You smell! Your father was an elderberry! Knock, knock! Mother smelled of hamsters! Knock, knock! Who's there? Euro! Europe! 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 I didn't think the Saxons were like The other thing they, they could do, they could exchange missiles. Have you got a missile? No, dear. Alright, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> now Bernoff knew that when the tide went out, as I said, the <laughs> no, just let him exchange another missile. There you go. <laughs> when the tide went out, North Yarland joined the mainland by this narrow causeway. So he sent his biggest, bravest and toughest warrior, Bernoff, to defend the causeway. When the, the Vikings see the causeway, try to cross, and they could only cross one at a time. Each one that crossed was killed and fell into the water. You don't need time, do you? And then the next warrior tried to cross. And he too was killed and fell into the water.
Pagan army led by Uber himself. Set foot upon the land of Whitby. And set upon our peaceful and little field. As a messenger runs to fetch the remainder of the armies of Uber and Hafta. Oh, 